The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it in all of its fullness. That's what you were talking about. And we want to look tonight at the story of the real comeback kid, Samson. I want to read from Judges. If you want to get the whole story, you have to read Judges 13, 14, 15 and 16. I thought that might be a bit much to read in public tonight. So I want to pick up uh, the reading in chapter 16, which is the last chapter, the conclusion of his story. And uh, if we pick it up in the first verse, I'll read the first five verses and then move down. I'll tell you where I'm going. One day Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no more during the they made no move during the night, saying, At dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Sometime later he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. You know the story of Delilah, don't you? She thought she'd be his ruin. But come with me to verse 15. After the temptings of the night, Delilah said to him, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I've been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with silver in their hands, having put him to sleep on her lap. She called a man to shave off the seven beads of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him then she called samson the philistines are upon you he awoke from his sleep and thought i'll go as before and shake myself free he did not know that the lord had left him then the philistine seized him gouged out his eyes and took him down to gaza binding him with bronze shackles and set him to grinding in the prison but the hair on his head began to grow again hallelujah after it had been shaved now the rulers of the philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to dagon their god and to celebrate saying our god has delivered samson our enemy into our hands when the people saw him they praised their god saying our god has delivered our enemy into our hands the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain while they were in high spirits they shouted bring out samson to entertain us so they called samson out of the prison and he performed for them and when they stood him among the pillars samson said to the servant who held his hand put me where i can feel the pillars that support the temple so that i may lean against them the temple was crowded with men and women all the rulers of the philistines were there and on the roof were about three thousand men and women watching samson perform and samson prayed to the lord o sovereign lord remember me o god please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the philistines for my two eyes then Samson reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them. 
his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtael in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel for 20 years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have a witness uh, tonight. The Lord laid it on my heart on Monday of this week that there would be a Samson here. A Samson here tonight. Someone who know that inside there is that call to destiny. You believe that you're called for something better than you've actually so far achieved in your life. But somehow or another, the tears have got amongst the wheat. The world and the flesh and the devil has conspired against you and you haven't fulfilled your potential. But God says, I haven't finished with you yet. You're yet to fulfill your potential and there will be greatness yet in your life. I believe that our God is a God of miracles. And when we were singing of El Shaddai just a, a short while ago, we were reminded of how God turned the Red Sea into dry land. And they crossed over. A teacher, you know, was told to uh, tell a story, this story. It was RE in junior school. It was uh, just year six and uh, the teacher wasn't a Christian, but this was the schedule, this was the story that the children had to learn. So she said, just open your Bibles and read the story of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. And as they were reading through, this little girl who was a believer saw the miracle of the Red Sea opening up and then drop crossing on dry land. And she said, hallelujah, loud in the class. And the teacher said, shut up. She said, I told you to read it quietly. Just carry on reading. And the teacher said, by the way, we don't believe that anymore. It wasn't the Red Sea that was fast flowing, it was the Reed Sea. Yes. And you know, it's only six inches deep. It didn't take a miracle, they could walk across it anyway. Just read on and be quiet. And so she read on in the story, and a short while later, this little brave Christian girl said, Hallelujah! And the teacher said, what are you getting so excited about now? She said, I've just read that God drowned all of the Egyptians in six inches of water. <laughs> One way or another, it was going to be a miracle. And our God is a God of miracles and he's here today to perform a miracle in someone's life. Someone that struggled, like Samson struggled. But God has come to set you free. The story of Samson has always had a great fascination to all people. The story has inspired music to be c composed, films to be made, operas to be performed. And the secret of its popularity, I'm sure, is its humanness. Samson, you know, was uh, the product of a miraculous conception and a motherly consecration, a godly mother that raised him to live right. From his earliest days, he was a Nazarite. You'll read about it in Numbers chapter 6. Set apart to God. No alcohol was to pass his lips. None of his hair was to be cut. This was the secret of his strength, being separated to God. And his exploits of strength caused him to be known as the world's strongest man at the time. But in spite of his illustrious start, he never fully mastered his carnal appetite. There was that lust in him that was eating away and spoiled much of his life. And in the end, it seems he ended in captivity and tragedy. But that's not the whole story. And I want to see us this evening, see Samson moving from 
this man of destiny to this man of victory via the way of ministry and tragedy. Notice with me, first of all, the destiny of Samson. This is a great story. We'll read of it in Judges chapter 13, as the screen says. This boy is to be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel. You've got to remember that Manoah, his father, and his wife, this was a, a godly couple, but like Elizabeth later on, she was barren and desperate to have a child and came and asked God for a child, promising that if they were given a child, he would be separated to God. He would live for God to fulfill God's purposes. Do you know I've been reading for the last couple of weeks, Jeremiah. It occurred to me as I was preparing this that God would say this to someone here tonight. Jeremiah 1, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you to be a prophet of the nations. You know, what was true of Samson, what was true of Jeremiah, is true of every born-again child of God. From before you were born, while you were in the mother's womb, God set you apart to be a child of destiny, to perform great things for him and in his name. Do you know, I get excited when I read the New Testament and I rediscover again and again that God's purpose for me is to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. That so we might be conformed to the very image of his son, Romans 8, 29. Do you believe that? Yes. That God wants you to be just like Jesus. Uh, I've got a long way to go. I'm 74. I might not have much longer, but I believe Hallelujah. that sooner or later I will be like Jesus. Amen. That's God's purpose for my life. It's exciting to know that God has a, a perfect plan for all of our lives. Amen. There's no need for us to drift along through life like cork or driftwood on the bobbing waves of life. And as we consider Samson's destiny, there are two things that are really important for us to notice. First of all, the course was made known. He will begin the deliverance of Israel. That was God's word to him. He was to be a deliverer. The one that God was to use to set his people free from the might of the Philistine. The Philistines were neighbors. They're still there in Palestinian territories. Still causing people to the people of God. But his calling was to be a deliverer. And for 20 years he ministered. While he ministered, the Philistines did not dominate them. The people of God were free. And our gospel is a gospel of freedom. What was true of Samson in the Old Testament is even more true of us. The Spirit of the Lord, said Jesus, is upon me, quoting Isaiah, that I might preach good news, that I might open the eyes of the blind, that I might set people free. Our gospel is a gospel of freedom. Do you believe that? Yes. Then why are so many of God's children slaves to sin? and not fulfilling their, their destiny. His course was known. We live in a sad, sad world. I don't know whether you know the name Malcolm Muggeridge. <laughs> He's now in the glory. But before he was converted, you know, he wrote a book, still available, and I've read it called Jesus Rediscovered. It's a great book. And it's a, a non-Christian, looking on at the failings of the church. And this was written in the 1960s. Listen to what he wrote. This is just a, a long, it's a sentence, but it's a long sentence. Writing on the failings of the established church, he ends with this admission. The thirst is very great, much greater and more widespread than is generally supposed. There is a conscious and passionate awareness that this morally appalling and spiritually impoverished affluent society with its accent everlastingly on consumption and sensual indulgence of every kind is no better than a pigsty. That's what he wrote in the 1960s. If that was true then, it's an even deeper pigsty that our society is today. There's a downward spiral and expresses eloquently the weariness of servitude and a deep longing for freedom. People are hungry to be set free. They don't want to be slaves to sin. They don't want to be slaves to habits that they can't break. And we have the answer. 
And your destiny as a child of God is to follow your course to be a deliverer in your day and your generation. But if we're to do that, we've not only got to notice the course, but also the conditions that were laid down. And in Judges 13, verse 5, we see what the Lord is saying to Manoah and his wife. The boy is to be a Nazarite. And I mentioned that earlier. You'll read about it in Numbers chapter 6. You see what a, a Nazarite means. It means someone who is separated to the Lord. This was to be the principle involved for Samson to know an effective and dynamic ministry. He needed to be separated to God. He needed to know holiness in his life. It means that we need to live as God wants us to live and not as we want to live. I quoted this morning, it must have been because I knew I was going to be saying it tonight. It was on my, it's been on my heart all this week to say this. It's from the story of Joshua. Before they entered into the promised land. This is what Joshua, the Lord said to Joshua and to the people. Consecrate yourself. And tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things. I believe that that is what on, is on God's heart for you at Trinity. To know a time of consecration. A time when you might consider being a Nazarite. Giving things up. This period of Lent, you know, is not about giving things up. Do you know what Lent means? Lent means spring. The Lenten season is a springtime. Let me ask you, have you done your spring cleaning yet? <laughs> My wife has. The house is like a bright pin. But this is, and all through Lent, my thought has been in Psalm 139, about my life needing a spring cleaning. Amen. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in your way everlasting. Amen. I believe that we need to spring clean our lives. To have a time of consecration. A time when we consciously give ourselves afresh to living a holy life. There's too much sin in the church. There's too many sinning saints. And God is calling you to holiness of life. That's why he died, to make us holy. You know I... I've let the Lord down badly in the past. Even as a minister of the gospel, I let him down badly. I failed. And when it was becoming public that I failed badly, this was a long time ago, decades ago, I went to see my mum. I wanted her to hear from me what I'd done. And I remember getting hold of me by my shoulders and her lovely face running down with tears. This godly woman. She got a hold of a very adult son by my shoulders and shook me. And she said, John, when will you learn to do what you're told? <laughs> I felt about 12, but that was a word from the Lord. When will you learn to do what the Lord wants you to do? It was a turning point. Thank God for forgiveness. Thank God for the second chance. Thank God that our God is a God of grace. But I'm here tonight to tell you that victory is possible. And the Lord is calling you to that path of freedom. Freedom in your own life. That you might be a messenger of freedom to other people. The course was made known. Samson was to be a deliverer of his people. But if he was to fulfill his destiny. He had to live like a Nazarite. He had to be a good boy. He had to do what he was told. What God wanted him to do. To follow the course. That was made known. I believe that the Lord often feels the same way 
how about us, you know, like my mum felt about me that time. I believe that there were some here tonight that God would give a good shaking to. And he'd say lovingly and with all grace, when will you learn to do what you're told? I believe that there's someone here tonight that needs to go through a period of absence from something. Not because it's Lent, but because you know it's God's will for you to do so. That was his destiny. Now let's look at his ministry. Samson led Israel for 20 years. 20 years he actually saw his people set free. What a ministry these verses reveal. As the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. And once again, I want us to know two things that I believe have a, a direct application to our lives today as we seek to live life in the Spirit. First of all, there are the, the blessings that he enjoyed. And at the same time, there were the battles that he endured. Those two things, they're part of the Spirit-filled life, you know. There are blessings. Throughout the 20 years of his ministry, the Holy Spirit kept on coming upon him. Read it. Please go home and read the whole story. In the Old Testament dispensation, it was only selected people that knew the Holy Spirit coming upon and working. Because atonement hadn't been made for sin, it was impossible for the Holy Spirit to come and reside in someone. So the best they could know was the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And boy, did the Holy Spirit come upon Samson over and over again. You read of the miracles that he did whilst full and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you know, and despite his failings, when you come to the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 11, when you've got that great record of the heroes of the faith, Samson is included. Isn't that great? That despite his failings, it's his blessings. He believed God to work the miraculous through the power of the Spirit. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit can not only set you free, but can use you to set other people free? I am waiting to see a church that declare together, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And really believe that the Holy Spirit can work in them and through them for the setting free of other people Hebrews 11 tells us that he was remembered for the exploits of his faith. Will you be remembered for the exploits of your faith? It's God's desire for you to be permanently and perpetually filled with the Holy Spirit. That he might do exploits. Let me say this. I've shared it with you before. Very important lesson about the Holy Spirit. The three very important prepositions in the New Testament used about the Holy Spirit. John 14 verse 17 finds Jesus saying the night before he was crucified, the Holy Spirit is with you and shall be in you. There are the two, first two, the Holy Spirit with us and in us. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is with everybody. He's the Spirit of God that's at work in the world. But he cannot come in until sin has been atoned for. And when Jesus went to the cross and he died that our sins might be forgiven he came back to those believing disciples and he greeted them with a shalom he showed them his hands you'll be thinking about this in a couple of weeks time Easter day his hands and his side the signs of the cross atonement had been made the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord and then he said peace shalom and he breathed on them and said, said, receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that had been with them and through which they had done exploits like the Old Testament saints had. Now he was going to reside in them. But he hadn't finished with them. Because it's not enough to know the Holy Spirit in you. Uh, you have to know the Holy Spirit in you to be born again. It's by the Spirit that we're born again. But it's not enough to do God's work. Listen to this, it's not enough to be born again. It's not enough to be saved. 
You've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got to know the Holy Spirit coming upon you. And Jesus said on the day of ascension, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's the third preposition. With, in and upon. And because Jesus died to make atonement for our sins, we can know the attunement of his spirit. We can know what it is to live in that state of perpetual fullness. We can move in the power of the Holy Spirit. My, what blessings there are for us to enjoy when we're separated to God. You see, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. I've preached on that year before. We can grieve him. And as we grieve him, he's limited in what he can do. But when we please him, there is no limit to what he can do. That's the blessings that he enjoyed, but oh, I tell you what, the spirit-filled life is not without its problems. Because the devil makes a earmark for those that are making a difference in the kingdom of God. He wants you to fail. He wants to knock you off your perch. And in chapters 14 and 16 of this book of Judges, we have a record of how Samson was attacked. And you know, he was attacked from two sources, amazingly. He was attacked from within, and he was attacked from without. What do I mean? He was attacked from within by his own people. His wife conspired against him. Delilah conspired against him. His own people, the people of Judah, his own people conspired against him. They were the ones that handed him over to the Philistines. And you know, I want you to know this. Some of the fiercest battles that you and I can know in the Christian life come from within. The world is outside, but the flesh is within. And we are betrayed by our own evil natures. You get that? Amen. And when you make a stand and you a consecrated and you want to live a holy life. Believe me, your family will not always understand why you want to be so single man, why you want to be in this place all the time. Instead of spending all your time with them and going out doing exciting things with them. And your family can be against you. I've seen a number of young people who have been wonderfully converted and they go home to their unchurched parents and their parents make their life a living hell. They don't want to become religious. They don't understand that being a Christian is not being religious. It's having a relationship with God. Amen. But they hate it. And families can turn against you just because you're a Christian. I've told you stories before about these things. But he was also attacked from without. He was attacked by the Philistines over and over again. They came to him. The Philistines! Delilah shouted, are upon you. Hear this. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The world, the flesh and the devil are against us. We've got a battle to endure. But we are on the victory side. We are fighting from victory to victory. This is God's word. His purpose, he's destined for you and I to live in victory. There's no need for you to be a slave to sin or a slave to Satan or a slave to the ways of this world. You can break free yes. and you can lead others in freedom as well. Hallelujah. So we've seen the destiny. He was called to be a deliverer, but the course was a life of consecration. We've seen his ministry for 20 years he struggled between the blessings that he enjoyed and the battles that he enjoyed. But what was the tragedy? Where did he fail? I think you know. He allowed himself to fall in love with people that he shouldn't have allowed himself to fall in love with. He fell in love with a Philistine again and again. Remember that he was a Nazarite, separated God. Be careful, listen to this, be careful not to flirt with the world. Amen. It paralyzes spiritual strength. It nullifies authentic witness and is totally obnoxious to God. Let me tell you, with my sister's permission, my older sister, I was a young youngster when 
she brought this tall hunk of a man home and she said this is my new boyfriend to my parents but he wants you to know he's an atheist an atheist you know what an atheist is don't you not just not believing God they're against God atheists are against God well my father and mother had something to say to my sister Eileen it wasn't pleasant here and it wasn't pleasant to live in that home for a while but she allowed herself to fall in love with him and she married him she had two children with him and she lived a miserable existence and one day when I was a minister in Barry, so that's going back to the 70s, she phoned me up and she said, John, I'm giving you permission to tell my story to whoever you want to tell it to. She said, watch your emotions. Tell people to watch their emotions because your emotions run away with you. Don't let your emotions dictate the decisions that you make. I want to tell you that until her husband died about 10 years ago, he made her life miserable. I want to say that since he's died, she's come back to the Lord. But she would still say, tell people, watch your emotions. She missed decades of living the Christian life because she followed her passions and she followed her emotions rather than doing what she knew God's will was for her life. See, the tragedy of Samson was not that he loved. <laughs> I mean, love is even the eros love, the passionate love. It's a gift of God. I mean, God loves sex. He created it. And when in love, we enjoy it. And he smiles. He says, this is good. On everything he creates, he says, this is good. No, it's not that he fell in love. It's who he allowed himself to fall in love with. It's not what, even what he did, but what he allowed to be done. He was robbed of his strength. He knew where his strength lay. It was in obedience to God. Thus, as a Nazarite, he had never had his hair cut but there is that verse in, that I read in chapter 16 verse 16 when Delilah is really nagging him look at this verse 16 she says with such nagging she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death oh the devil is cunning isn't he Samson tired of temptation he fell again and notice how temptation came at the same spot time and time again. It was through the lust of the flesh. You know, stories told of an old battle during the days of the Norman. People were living in a mass massive fortified uh, castle and they felt really secure in this fortified castle. But the enemy came, they only had one cannon and they looked over the wall and they felt very secure they had nothing that could really, really bother them. But with this one cannon, they kept on firing cannonballs at one spot, over and over again, until there was a breach in the wall, and then they entered in, and how they caused havoc. You know, the devil knows your weak spot. He knows your strengths too. And often he attacks not only your weaknesses, he attacks your strong points. And over and over again, the devil will come nagging day after day, night after night, and ultimately he knows that so many of God's children will fail. That's his strategy, going for the same spot in our life, and he persists until he breaks down our defenses. Samson was pressed daily until he was robbed of his strength. Notice these two things, what Samson allowed to happen. He allowed himself to be robbed of the secret of his strength. His strength was in the, his communion with and his obedience to God. Today, if we allow those two areas to be ignored, 
or nullified, you can be absolutely sure that you will fail as Samson failed. He allowed disobedience to enter into his life. And you do that, beware. But not only what he allowed to happen, it's what he assumed would happen. He presumed, uh, in verse 20 of chapter 16, it's worth reading again. He called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. He assumed upon the grace and the goodness of God that just as other times he'd shake himself and he found the strength of the Lord, he assumed that God would come through for him again. Now let me assure you that us children of the new covenant, God has promised, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He will not take his presence from us, but he will take away the awareness of his presence. And unless we're living in communion with him, we cannot know the fullness of life. And it's not enough just to be a normal Christian when you're facing the wiles of the devil, the world, and our own flesh. The psalmist wrote, keep your servants from presumptuous sins. We can presume, as Samson presumed, that God will come through for us, but unless we're walking in close communion, we may be disappointed. He may not come through because we haven't met the conditions of the promise. Samson went into battle and he knew ultimate to failure, to defeat and dishonor. What a tragedy. This man of destiny, this man of such a powerful ministry, now is a man of tragedy, but the story is not complete. Finally, we observe the victory of Samson. Look at verse 21 with me. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Oh, I want to tell you, that was a sign that God was beginning to move in his heart again. And notice in verse 28. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me, O God. Please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines. What was happening here? Two things. Penitence was moving. Repentance was beginning to move in his heart. Notice his tears and his prayers as he was grinding at the mill. He was thinking about what might have been, how he'd come to this sorry, sordid state. And repentance was beginning to flow. And he prayed, O oh, Sovereign Lord, remember me, strengthen me. Maybe you're in that place. You're grinding at a mill. You're actually finding yourself doing something day after day that you're not really enjoying. You're just grinding away at the mill. You don't feel that you fulfilled your destiny. Make this your prayer. As tonight you feel the Holy Spirit moving upon you and in you and you're saying, oh God, I realize I've made too many mistakes. Maybe penitence is moving you and God is saying to you, then look upwards. Look away from yourself and look up and make this your prayer. Sovereign Lord, Lord of all, remember me. Make it your prayer. Strengthen me. Do you know what will happen? If you make that prayer in honesty of heart, the Sovereign Lord will move in and omnipotence, the all-powerful God will master you once more and move you on. And this is what happened to uh, Samson. God moved in in response to that prayer. God is waiting, my friends, to master you to help bring you back into line that you might fulfill your potential. And I want to tell you, I believe someone might be saying, but you don't know what I've done, John. No, I don't. 
but Jesus does. I want to tell you this, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is nothing that you have done that God cannot forgive. Give him a clap. He's a great saviour. And he's waiting to move into your life and master you again. They were mocking him. They, they brought him into their temple, the temple to Dagon. They were not only mocking, you see, Samson, they were mocking Samson. Beware of mocking our God. Beware of blaspheming and daring to believe that God cannot rescue you. God, God cannot save you. You see, not only was Samson's reputation at stake, God's honor was at stake. So he asked for this boy to lead him to the temples. There were temple pillars and he leans against them. Oh God, he says, give me strength once more. And with a mighty crush, Dagon's temple falls to the ground and 3,000 Philistine men and women die. I don't rejoice in the death of anyone. But learn this. This was God's doing. And therefore it's going to be marvellous in our eyes. You see, we're told that he killed more in his death than he did in his life. He didn't end a failure by bringing himself back into the will of God. Though there were certain things he could never do again, there was something that he could do. He could fulfill his destiny. What was it? It was to actually bring deliverance to Israel. And in his death, he did that. He broke the yoke once and for all. <laughs> Hear this, it doesn't matter what you've done. It can be forgiven. It doesn't matter how long you've lived. What matters is what lies ahead. And God is here to master you tonight, to bring you back into the conformity of his will, that you might begin to fulfill your potential, fulfill your destiny. And God laid a word on my heart as I was preparing this on Monday from Joel chapter 2. He promises you, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. You know, these are wasted years. Some of you here have wasted too many years. Too many, too much time has gone under the bridge without you being effective for God. That ends tonight. Amen. As you come and you move back into the center of God's will for your life. Samson lived 3,500 years ago. But I believe with all my heart that he's God's again for someone here in the meeting tonight. And I want to say, listen to what God is saying. You know that God's been speaking to your own heart. Don't look around and say, this, I think this is a very appropriate word for him or for her. No, no. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Test me. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in your way everlasting. I believe God is calling you. And if you feel that call of God on your life tonight to get back on track, and no deliverance that you might lead others into deliverance, then come for ministry by all means as we close the meeting. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are here, and that's a bless. And although you may have been speaking specifically to one or two people, I believe there's something in this message for all of us tonight. We pray that you'll help us to apply it to our lives, that we might live more consecrated lives. Make us to be a holy people. Lord, I pray for this church here at Trinity. I want to thank you for it, Lord. Their very reason for existence is that they might see revival again in our day and our generation. Will you not disappoint them? Will you find, Lord, the remnant that are faithful and true to you, that are living consecrated lives? And will you not make them the instruments of revival? Come, Lord, I pray, and revive these people and make them the instruments of a revival in this area and wider field come and do a new thing through them, I pray. This new season, Lord bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The worship group is going to come back and lead us in some worship. If you need ministry, we're here to provide it. I mentioned this morning uh, this book that I, booklet I've written, Heaven and How to Get There. I ran out of copies this morning, but I brought some more. If you want a copy, 
uh, then place it, take it off the table afterwards by all means. Let's uh, wait on God as we in worship. If you need prayer, please do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye